Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 96. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today, we've got a bunch of people. We've got Orion. Hello. All the way from Florida. What's up? Oh, yeah, in Florida. You're in a different state every time. Uh, we've got Lindsay. Yep. All the way from 20 minutes away from Mark. <laughs> and we have Mark. Now there are two of us. Same spelling, too. You know, he left the door unlocked, so that's his mistake. <laughs> Mark has been a longtime supporter of the Thoughtful Gamer. He's here to play some games, and I said, hey, we're podcasting, too, so hop on in. Actually, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you have definitely heard me reference Mark as he often watches our live streams and comments. So now he's just doing that in person for an in, in all-new experience. Would you say he's a landmark of the podcast? We're going to anyway. be cov- <laughs> We're going to be going down my top 100 games of all time. It is that time again. I try to do this every 2 years. Initially I was going to do it every year, but there wasn't as much movement on it as I wanted, and then I was like, "Well, let's just do it every 2 years." The problem was that the 2020 version was at the very end of 2020, and now it is the very beginning of 2022. So on paper, it's been two years, uh, but it's really been like a year and three months. For 2024, I'll try to do it at the same time of the year again. Anyways, so... Traditionally, you do it in like March or April. April yeah, that's right? what I thought, and I didn't last time. So <clears throat> past Mark messed up, and current Mark is going to be cool with that. But... Yeah, it's an interesting list. There's not a lot of movement, a lot. Well, there's a good amount of movement. There's not a lot of changes. I think I counted total 15 different, or excuse me, 15 new games to the list total uh, in a good, you know, an equal number. Yeah, by definition, an equal number have dropped off. <laughs> but yeah, 15 all new games, or rather 14 all new games in one game, only one that was on a previous list, fell off last t- the, the list last time and is now back on the list. So that'll be fun. Yeah, it's interesting to see what the big movers were, and it was definitely influenced by the pandemic because two-player games and light games are on the rise, and heavy games I haven't played in four years are falling. Also, I moved away, and we were probably the two main heavy game players, so That's I'm true. sure that was part of it. Um, but a lot of I do avoid games, them at all all costs. Yeah, a lot of the heavy games Amber likes, but you know she doesn't play as much, and a lot of them you want more people involved. So you know certain heavy games like Imperial Struggle, Amber, Amber played with me, and I think I got her to play Space Corp once. You know, there's been a couple others we're planning on playing, so she'll play with them. But the, the ones, the heavy games that require multiple people have not been played for sure. And yeah, it takes a hit a little bit. This is more, I think, I think the theme of this list is going to be the way games have sat in my memory, because a lot of them I haven't played in a long time. So I, I don't know what influences a game to improve or go down in my memory when I'm comparing two different lists at different points in time when I haven't played the game necessarily at all since then. I don't know. It'll be fun to explore. So we're going to go with the first 25 games. Uh, and we don't need to necessarily talk in detail about all of them. So maybe I'll link, I'll group up some of them. I'll point out some notable changes. This list is going to have a good number of new games, including the first four on our list here, starting with number 100, The Search for Planet X. If Amber were here, she would probably be upset that it's not higher. I think it's like in her top 10 by now. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. So I just reviewed this one. It's a deduction game. And Amber and I spent like an entire weekend playing it like seven times in a row. Uh, because she's like, well, let's just play it again. Instead of playing these other games, we'll just play this one over and over again. So honestly, if we had played it like five or six times over that weekend, it might have even been higher, but I burned out of it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and I want to play it again, but now you're already burned out, which is a little bit sad. But, I'm not that um, I really, yeah, I really enjoyed this game. I don't uh, want to so play, play it again. with Amber two players again. I think 
adding more players mm-hmm. to it will uh, shake it up a bit. But the two-player game, I don't know, I, f- I feel like I've kind of figured it out. I almost played this game, but then we didn't end up playing it, so I was sad. Yeah, you would like this one, Orion, for sure. It's like you've played Alchemist, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like Alchemist if you got rid of almost everything except the deduction stuff. So it's just guessing and figuring out the the conclusions? Yes. Yeah, it's just really good as far as pure deduction. You still have to use an app to get the information. Each player gets a different set of information. You're watching each other trying to figure out what they know and trying to make inferences based on that. So a really nice distillation of the alchemist's logic. Yeah. Okay. But instead of doing like a whole worker placement thing, you're just like asking specific questions. So you're trying to, you know, you'll search like a, a range of the sky and it'll tell you how many of a given type of item are in that range uh, to try to narrow down stuff. It's really neat. It's just like a more fun stats class, in my opinion. <laughs> I had a blast um, in stats class. I don't know about you. Yeah. No, it's reminding me of a class that I took. Uh, it was called Combinatorics, and we just basically figured out, like, what is the likelihood of the next, like, a poker hand that you could possibly get based on what you were dealt. So, yeah, essentially that kind of that kind of thing. But When I took that class, it was called Business Statistics. Combinatorics mm-hmm. sounds way more interesting. <laughs> it's a way more fun name, in my opinion. Yeah. Next on the list, starting a string of games that we talked about recently from PAX Unplugged, which maybe is why they're they're grouped here. Uh, but number 99 is The Estates. Number 98 is Smartphone Inc. And number 97 is the game I just reviewed, QE. So yeah, we already talked about these, but I guess I should go into how I did this list. So I the same as I've done the last couple of times is that you know I have all the games I've rated, I've given scores to. And I use the Pub Meeple ranking engine, uh, which if you haven't heard of it, you give it a list of items and then it'll set up head to head matchups one after the other until it formulates a ranking based on what you select on those head to head matchups. So what I do is I just I submit all of the games of a particular rating. So in this instance, all these games I gave an eight to. So they were part of the eight group. And then I did all the head to head matchups and then it just gave me a list. So it's not me just sitting down and writing a list. I find this to be easier because I can just go by my gut feeling. So I found it bizarre that all of these like brand new games, given that method, ended up right next to each other. But yeah, the Estates and Smartphone Inc. I haven't played again since PAX. QE we got. Thank you, Orion, who sent it over to us uh and we've played it once more and it's still absolutely bonkers and fascinating i thought you liked estates just a hair more than the other ones mark all of these are so close together (laughs) that's the thing though like i don't know if it ever paired up the estates against qe for instance in that i don't know exactly the details of that ranking thing or if it just deduced it through other pairings but yeah I mean, it's, it, it demonstrates how, you know, when the games, when I feel very similarly about the games, how I would specifically rank them is very variable day to day. For instance, I don't know if my best of 2019 or best of 2020 list orders have been maintained. I don't think they have been maintained on this top ranking. So it fluctuates. Honestly, the first, the, from like 100 to like 40 I saw are all pretty close. Are those all of, eights and eights and a half? Eight and they're a half. all eights. There's some eights that are definitely at the top of the eights, and there's some there's some eights some that eights are definitely that towards the bottom. Some of these, once I play them more, may rise. Uh, but yeah, there's a big chunk. Don't give too much credence to the specific order of the, that these went into. Anyways, I want to play all these games more. Anyways, yeah, these are all fun. Knowing you, I think the estates is going to rise. That's a really nasty game. Yeah, I really, I really didn't like that game. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel. I appreciated oh. it, but boy, it was it was harsh. <laughs> it is, yeah. If I got a, it's one of those games. If I found a group that really liked playing it, and I played it four or five times. It might rise up a lot. Yeah, or I might start loathing it because it's so mean. But I tend to like mean games. Number 96 is the first coin game on the list. Definitely not the last. Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection. Probably the quirkiest of the coin games I've played. Pendragon uh, is sort of weird, but we never actually played a full game of that. Pendragon has more systems going on. This one had 
yeah, it added extra stuff because there's the whole like naval component and the variable entry times and and stuff in, a, in, in addition to the normal asymmetry. So Yeah, he had a lot of interesting stuff with one of the factions riding in at a later time. They were they would like influence resources from it was the French from afar, yeah. and at some point they enter the war. Uh, so I I like that one. I don't know how good it is if you play it a lot and try to be competitive, but in terms of its ability to tell a story, I think it did pretty well. Decrypto is number ninety five. Code names quirky cousin. I still enjoy it. I'm just like confused why it's not number one. That's. Do you like confused. it more than code names? I like it more than code names. I think, but I think that could be because of uh, code names burnout and decrypto was a fresh take on code names because I still love code names. So I think maybe I'm looking at it. I'm not looking at them when I first learned them. I'm looking at it as a as an alternative that we've played less. But I that's think fair. it's so fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I think it's a little clunky. I do enjoy it quite a bit, but I, compared to code names, I think it's clunky. I've also been playing code names duet with Amber. We've had a few sessions of that, and boy, do I get angry at code names <laughs> duet. Uh, Have you improved your skills with Amber? I know, I know, it's been, rough, it's been rough out there. Wow. Ah, well, here's the thing. Progress. <laughs> so we were playing Codenames Duet has the like the campaign thing where you start. In, oh, like, you, the you the different cities, mode. right? Yeah, super yeah. easy, and it, and it changes the difficulty of how many guesses you would get and how many like incorrect guesses you get. Mm-hmm. The problem is we're. Amber and I are both very prideful about our abilities in this game. And so, like, the first mission, you can almost give one clues the entire way through. Almost. You have to give, like, 1.3 clues per turn to win. We are still going for, like, three and four clue words. And so we lost it a number of times through the assassin uh, before we actually won it. And it took it took a little bit of like, okay, we can literally just give one clues all the way through here to win this. And then we uh, I think we might have won one other before we started going wild again. I think uh, they should make every couple play this before they get married as like a tester to see if you have like positive communication. If you can make it through. Yeah, Amber and I would not pass that test. Doesn't change my my, my opinion. <laughs> I think it's an experience that every couple should have of like trying to figure out how each other thinks. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, but anyways, Decrypto, yeah, it's weird. It's quirky. I like it, though. I like a lot of word I, games, honestly. I found I found guessing in Decrypto to be miserable and giving clues to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I but think it's better. I only played it like twice. That's true. Yeah. Codenames is just kind of, I don't know what you get in Decrypto so far beyond what you get in Codenames without all the complication. All right, quirky, but I like it though. Is what most people would, you know, refer to me as um, in their friendship. So I feel like that's how I relate to the crypto as a game. You're you're the decrypto of a friend group. <laughs> yep. Number ninety four is Forbidden Desert, which we just played recently, uh, and it's still solid. I still think it's definitely better than Pandemic. It's not one I'll play all the time, but it's uh, it, it's a solid game still. It's got good stuff. Did you ever play Forbidden Sky? I have. Okay, is this better? Uh, once, I didn't think it was as good, but it's definitely aimed more towards gamer. It's definitely more difficult from what I remember. This was a long time ago. I think I played it solo just to play through it, and it's definitely one where you... The one thing I remember was that there's a certain point, kind of early to mid point in the game, where you have to sit there and just figure out the game. Like, you have to figure out the solution of what you're doing the whole rest of the time, was the impression I got, which isn't quite as interesting to me. I I prefer the chaos, I think, of Forbidden Desert. I agree. I like, Desert is my favorite of all of them. I prefer islands of all of the Forbidden, like, in real life, I prefer islands over skies and deserts, but um, of the games that I've acted, of the games themselves... I think it's the best um, mix of complexity without being kind of like too big for its britches, which I think a little bit is Forbidden Sky. And I think Forbidden Island is nice for like playing with family. But I, I think personally, I prefer I would pick Desert yeah. of the options. And also a reminder, it's like the best board game gift because it has super broad appeal and it's dirt cheap. It's like and it comes $14. in a cool tin. Yeah. I don't know how Game Right gets the price point so low on that game. But it's like, I think the MSRP might be under $20, and then it regularly sells for like $13, $14. It's insane. 
No idea. Yep. All right. Number 93 is the game I think that might have fallen the most, but stayed on the list. I think it has the, yeah, it dropped the absolute most of any game while still remaining on the list. Uh, and that's The Gallerist. Ah, which I'm I justified think... in my relative hatred of The Gallerist. It's so good. It's it such so a good game. So good. Do you hate fun? Or no, art? I just hate it relative to the other games. No, the other, I think um, it's just whatever it's games. an A tier Lacerda instead of an S tier Lacerda. I okay, that's fair. Okay, yeah. I think it's a B tier Lacerda, and everything else is an A or S tier. <laughs> Did you play? But a it's still like Orion. Yeah, I mean that one was not as good. Okay, is but I only C-tier? played it the once, so yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, I think I never I never played Mars though, so I can't compare it to that one. Or doesn't he have another new one? Uh, that's a new kind. Maybe not. Uh, Weather Machine is finished on Kickstarter. Anyways, it doesn't doubt yet. No, it's there's nothing wrong with the Gallers. It's good. I just don't like it as much as the other Lacerda games. Yeah, that's fair. No, I think I, I'm leaning a little bit more towards yours. I think it's definitely the most accessible of them, uh, which is why I end up playing it more. Because if I'm going to introduce someone to a Lacerda game, that's the one I introduce them to. But I don't know if there's quite as much depth in the gallerist as in as in the other ones the other ones that i like um that will be higher definitely more in lisboa and i think venus does a lot venus does a lot of the same things that the gallerist does but in a tighter more intricate package i think i would like to play the gallerist over venus personally feels bigger uh the gallerist and venus feel a little bit smaller uh, mm-hmm. But I think Venus uh, has more going on. So I, I still love the Gallerist, which is why it's on the list. But it has fallen a good chunk. I think is I'm that biased. just you haven't gotten it out in the last three years because group heavy gaming? I think it might be the only Lacerda game I have played during. I think I've played it during the pandemic. Really? Okay. Maybe. Yeah, we've played Venus for sure, but I've never I haven't played the Gallerist with you at least. Hmm. Let's change that. I think I like Gallerist more than average just because I seem to always win. <laughs> That's true. I probably do better at the Gallerist. I, I feel with the Gallerist, I feel pushed into the same game loop and yeah. I can't seem to escape that. It's like you have to end up buying four paintings or whatever. And there's no, I haven't figured out how to make like a go for a bunch of goals early or do something else um, work. So it feels kind of like you get stuck in the same game loop and then it's an optimization of who hit the right timing. I don't know. Yeah, I think what makes the gallerist interesting is the timing aspect and actually the worker placement. So like when you push people off, how you manipulate who can go where and in what order. That might be the, kind of where the depth is. But yeah, the, the, the core loop of the game is pretty straightforward. There are different variations you can do on that loop, and you can go for, like, you know, trying to lean on, invest in paintings for a long time and and max out their value, or you can try to kind of turn around paintings real quick. But, you know, you're pretty constrained within those, that spectrum. Um, Yeah, but to, to sell them, you have to have the contract, which is an extra, like, two actions to get it and then sell it, right? mm -hmm. So it's hard to fit that in as much as you might like. Yeah. Or there's a lot of opportunity cost to fitting that in. Number 92 is a game I'm going to play in just a couple of weeks again. Demacher, the game about German elections. It's quirky and fun. It is number one on Board Game (laughs) Geek. Literally the first entry. If you look at, if you you go to Demacher on Board Game Geek and look at the URL, it has the ID number one. Nice. So why isn't it number one? It is. It is the most interesting game relative to its source material, I think, or theme material. <laughs> I don't know. I think German elections are actually really fascinating. So I, I understand okay. when, you, why when, you, when you say German elections, that doesn't sound interesting to me. But once you get into actually how the system works, it is yeah. m- interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good game. Uh, it's it, has the there square. been an updated version of it that there like has been? Okay. Although I believe it was met with some controversy over some of the rules changes. And so I think the version I'm playing at the convention is going to 
either be the same modified version of the old one that we had or the new one, but modified to make it more like the old one. Okay. I think it's the former. I think it's still the old version mod with some with some modifications to to just to eliminate a couple of like super random elements and make them slightly more predictable. Um, mm-hmm. But I know that there were some changes in the new version that a lot of people did not like. So somewhere in the middle, I think, is probably the ideal game. Number 91 is Churchill, another game that you can test uh, your relationship status with. <laughs> this is a game where you have to em- <laughs> you have to embrace the game bubble for this game. <laughs> I've made a an, an critical error. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mark. <gasps> He's I've Miss made 92? a terrible error. We skipped over number 92, the real number 92. I said Demacher was number 92. It was not. There's a surprise number 92. Returning to the list, this is the one game that left the list and now has returned. It's Galaxy Trucker. Choo-choo. Mark, even you thought you knew the direction of this podcast, but no one does. We thought, you know, even... uh, Ryan and I specifically didn't want to know the list um, to keep things to keep us guessing, and even for you, you're still guessing, and you knew the list. So surprises all around. Yeah, I don't know. I missed that one, but yeah, Galaxy Truck is the actual number two, n- ninety two, which makes Democracy ninety one and Churchill ninety. Again, not that it matters that much. Uh, yeah, Galaxy Trucker. I haven't played it. I don't know why it left the list last time. I thought that would definitely be on the list. It's taken an epic fall, Probably- not, not because I dislike it. Although we did get to a point where we definitely needed the expansions. Mm -hmm. We got to a point where the base game got too easy. But yeah, Galaxy Trucker on my 2017 list was at 19. On the 2018 list, it was at 48. Then it left the list, and now it's 92. Wow. That's interesting. Maybe it's a lack of uh, Vladicon. That's true. I haven't been to Vladicon. I don't know if it's existed in the last couple of years. Yeah. It's a forgettable game to me, to be honest. Like, I love Vlada games in general, but I would say, you know that, but I would say it's more, one of the more forgettable games of his, to be honest. Like, I don't ever think about really? playing it. The only problem I've had with it is that it just got too easy after a while with just the base game, but the expansion materials really shook it up, but I think we only played that with the expansion stuff once. We got to play that get again. Get the big box out. I yeah. think I could get Amber to play that one with me because Amber really likes Galaxy She liked that Parker. one. Yeah. I should note down that I should play that again. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's also that we all like Space Alert better, though, too, right? So there's two Vlada games, same art style, both real-time, but we prefer one. Uh, so that one gets played more than, than Galaxy Trucker. But yeah, I don't know why it left the list last time. It shouldn't have left left the list. Anyways, back up to 90. Churchill, uh, what were you saying about it, Orion? <laughs> I was saying this is a game you definitely need the game bubble for. Yes. Because... Uh... You have to not take it personally when people team up on you. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, especially when Amber's involved. She loves this game. She does, but she does recognize she needs to be in a particular mood to play it. Yeah, same. Um, same. I also have the kind of sequel to it I got, but I haven't played yet, which is called Pericles, uh, which is the same is kind of three-player <laughs> dynamic. Although it might be four-player. I don't know. Heracles, that's the guy system. from like the Athenian Republic back in the Peloponnesian Wars. Yeah, right? it's like Athens and Sparta and I forget who else. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's good stuff. Yeah. Churchill also has my favorite second edition rule implementation. I don't know if I talk, talked about this before, but I was looking it up. Was this the one with the second player victory con or... Yeah, so there's the one victory. So Churchill has a number of different ways to end the game, and the and the victory changes based on that to try to simulate the idea. It's pushing this idea that in World War II, the dynamic between United States, England, and the Soviets needed to be one of kind of balance between them. And so the idea that it's, it's pushing kind, it's is kind of that about they who... all want to win, but only by a little bit, so the other two don't gang up on you. It was about who comes out as the leader of the world post-war. It's basically at some point the the outcome of the war versus Germany was decided and it was who was going to be best positioned in the post-World War II world as kind of the leader of the world. And if one is too far ahead, the other two would gang up on them and effectively you would lose the three-player dynamic. Yeah. So you can win by so much that that doesn't matter. 
that's hard to do. But so I have this thing with where if it ends in a certain way, you were too far ahead. And so what would happen is that you would, the person in first place would roll a die and they would lose that many points. And the person in last place would roll a die and they would gain that many points. People did not like this rule, which sure, if you're coming from Euro games, it doesn't make any sense. Based on the historical argument he's making, I think it makes sense. So anyways, people clamored for a rule change uh, for this. And so the rule change was that in this situation, person first place would lose five points and the person in last place would gain five points. So it was just locked in stone. Uh, But if you read the blog post where Mark Herman talks about this, he also has no clue why people were clamoring for this. And so he says, okay, so I'll roll a die. It's a five. And that's why it's five points. (laughs) Because he just rolled a die and it came up as five. (laughs) Which uh, I thought there was something about if that changed the outcome, the second place person instead won. That could be. It was just the thing about like the die roll changing your point value at the end that people didn't like. Uh, Yeah. Which so I'm still going to play it the original way. I have the first printing, I think. So my my copy doesn't even have that rule in it. it. Doesn't have the five. You roll the die. Number 89 is. The Crew, Mission Deep Sea, the new version of The Crew. I contemplated kind of combining The Crew versions, but I didn't because there. I think there's enough of a change in this one with the randomized uh, missions uh, that it, 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 I'll count it as a separate game. Uh, we played through this online a bit, and I think it's interesting. I don't know how much I love the randomized mission thing instead of the missions that were actually uh, pre-designed. But, I mean, the crew is a great game, so it makes the, the sequel makes the list on the strength of the cooperative trick-taking, which is still brilliant. I think I would put, in like rankings today, I would put the sequel higher than the original because I've played the original a lot, and I think the sequel is more interesting at this point. Yeah, maybe maybe if I play it more. There's just the I, variety I, I liked, of missions, the variety of missions variety. in the sequel is more interesting to me. Yeah, there's more variety in the sequel, but I was less confident that, like, we were running through it, and, like, some of them were so easy, and then we got one particular combination that was weirdly difficult. Like, the the difficulty variance changes a lot more, I feel like, whereas the original crew, it felt pretty smooth uh, in terms of difficulty Mm -hmm. ramping up as you progress throughout the missions, which Mission Deep Sea, granted, does have... A method of ramping up the difficulty it's not purely random it's it's semi-random but within that i it, it felt a little bit zany yeah i mean this this game in general is just one of my favorite trick taking games for sure i mean if i if i was doing my own top 100 the top 10 and 20 would be like uh various party games and de- de- deception games as well as trick taking games so this is would definitely be be in that yeah um but yeah love this game yeah i think this might be the only uh trick-taking game that would make my top 50 or top 100 yeah i thought about spades quite a bit we play it a lot and i do like it but i don't know how good it is uh so it didn't it didn't make the list yeah i don't think like there's a lot of merit and it's not that complex like there's not that much to it the actual game that you're playing there's a lot of strategy within it but i agree that it took someone like significantly more effort to come up with a crew than it did you know spades yeah i would say spades is i don't know if, if it's into the style of game that you kind of you play while chatting. Yeah. Spades is a game you play with friends while you're hanging out. Yeah. Not a game that you would play at a convention. Yeah. Number 88 is Go. I got to respect it. I'm the worst Go player on earth, but man, I respect it a whole lot. It's an incredible game. You know, yeah. everyone We've talked about this before, yeah. but the, just the subtlety in every move is incredible. I'm too dumb for Go, so. Oh, I am too, but I, I still like it. It did drop quite a bit. It was in it was fifty one last year, but again, that's just I'm gonna I don't think my thoughts about Go have changed since then. Uh it's just the, You you and Matt especially were super into Go and were playing it a bunch like two years ago, two or three years ago. Yeah. Maybe that's it. It was just closer to when a, a little bit when I was playing. Uh, and I haven't returned to it necessarily. Yeah, I don't think I've returned to it in the pandemic. But maybe I will. Maybe I'll try it again. Maybe I'll be better at it. 
Number 87 is Let's Make a Bus Route, which I believe finally got an English printing, which uh, good for it. Another game I need to play. Yeah, maybe I'll try to get a copy of it. I think someone finally printed it. Although I think they switched up the geography. I, the original game, I believe, is in Tokyo. It's set in like the Tokyo bus route, but they made it an American city for, or something. Which I don't know why Lame. you need to do that. Anyways, number 86 is Viticulture, which has tumbled. It tumbled last year. So Viticulture was one of the early games that I got and loved it. Still love it. But its flaws have revealed its, you know, revealed themselves to us. Um, and I don't love it quite as much as before. It actually was number 25 on my first two lists, then dropped to 81, now 86. So, yeah, I think this this grouping is kind of where it belongs. After playing the base game online on Board Game Arena, I now have a much fuller understanding of why the Tuscany version is better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because... Man, people who are good at viticulture base game are really good, and but they've kind of figured it out. Okay, my only problem with Tuscany, and it's really good, is that it takes a one-hour game and makes it like a two-and-a-half-hour game. That's true. It does add, yeah, it adds a lot. But uh, oh, And I if also, you want to say it's a better game, I don't disagree. I just, that's my biggest complaint against it. I also figured out we were playing a rule wrong this entire time. Oh, the thing with the the Papa Meeple, right? The big yeah, yeah, meeple? the 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 big guy, Grande. That you the can't grande. take the you don't get the bonus uh, when you use a Grande worker on a space. Which honestly, I kind of prefer the way we were playing it. Uh, it makes the game even more brutal than it was in terms of blocking. So what happens when you play online is that turn order, like if you have the impetus on turn order. On your wake up chart, you just select the first one pretty much always because turn order becomes immensely important. And so I think that's the biggest thing the Tuscany thing fixes is it adds more more thought into the turn order because yeah, when you don't get those bonus things on your grande workers, it makes getting to a space first even more important. And turn order was already important in that game. Number eighty five is Inish which, man, I want to play again because it's fading from my memory. I considered bringing it today, but then I it sounded like there'd only be two or three of us, and it's, you really want the four players for that. Yeah, yeah. Because last time, last list was number 44, now it's number 85. Yeah, I, I just got to play it again. Maybe I'll try to play it at, at, at the conventions coming up. If I remember, I'll bring it. Uh, that's one I want to get the expansion for just because uh, the only potential flaw with it is that the end game could take a long time if everyone's sort of munchkinning the leader and dragging them down and having a forced i think three round end game might help that problem Mm -hmm. yeah is this Uh, that one where you like go in and fight and both people have to agree that there be peace and then or whatever okay yeah i don't i don't think you like i remember being i I did not like this one i remember being super salty about the way it ended the (laughs) the time we played i don't even remember the situation i think looking back i could have won but i missed something or i could have stopped you from winning or something i don't remember yeah. The cool thing, though, is that it's this drafting game where the card set is so limited that even into your first play, you understand, you start to understand all the cards available. And then the game becomes trying to figure out who has which cards, which is a really fascinating take on drafting is that it gets that minute into just figuring out who has which cards. That was one of my problems with it, because we only it was only the first time we played it. And I just got, you know, blindsided by a card that I didn't know existed that was like the perfect card to counter the situation I had set up and I didn't know that was a thing so literally Anyways. a counter spell yeah yeah. Uh, yeah yeah now we got two blue. <laughs> two in a row uh, that are brand new first number 84 for science which I believe no pun included just named their best game of the year wow really it's good that's for sure yeah i pl- i believe they named it their top game of 2021 i don't think it'll be my top game of 2021 but maybe it will uh we gotta play it more we gotta hone in our difficulty yeah you i think we our group did so well with it we need to ramp up the difficulty more yeah we gotta ramp it up because yeah the the way we were playing it was too too simple uh i actually had to play this way back at 
the last Granite Games Summit or two Granite Games Summits ago. I got to play a mm. prototype version of this with Eric back when it had a different name of uh, when it had its pre-pandemic <laughs> name, which was Science or Die. But then they thought that was a little gruesome. Uh, <laughs> so they changed the name. If you die in the game, you die in real life. Yeah, it's it's got this thing that a lot of games I like have in which it's both. I mean, it's more complex it's not really a party game. It's too complex to be a party game, but it has the humor of a party game <laughs> with all of like the roles that you have to go do crazy things. So it's like this like gamers party game uh, reminds me a lot of like space alert for that and for being real time for that reason. Uh, this is when I can see rising for sure. Once we hone in the difficulty and get it to where it's a good challenge for us because uh, it's really fun. Three, also new to the list, is Babylonia, newish Reiner Knizia game, which we played when we were visiting you in North Carolina, Orion, and I found it very, very intriguing. You didn't play with me, though. I don't remember this yeah, one. Yeah, you, me, and Amber. Babylonia? Babylonia. Describe this game. I don't remember It's a kind of, of abstract weird. you're placing tiles, and you're trying to, you're ultimately trying to make these big net, kind of network connections. Wow, I have no memory of that. Yeah, That's bizarre. it was really fun. It was intriguing, though. It was intriguing. I think this one's on the list more for, I think, the possibility of how good it could get. Uh, but I got to play it more. Amber didn't love it, so I haven't been able to play it again. <laughs> but I really want to play it. I keep bringing it up to people. But then Amber's like, eh, it was okay. And she scares them off. Number 82, my favorite of the escape room style games. It's called Son of Dr. Esker's Notebook. It's probably the most obscure game on my list. Uh, so it's called Son of Dr. Esker's Notebook because it's the sequel. The first one was, was very good also. I think the puzzles were just a little bit stronger in this version. Uh, I think you got to buy it from the guy directly. Seems like a really nice guy, and I highly recommend it. If you like the exit games... That style of gaming, uh, none of the exit games have made my list. I haven't encountered any of them uh, that have the level, the puzzle level that this game does. Although the exit games, you know, are a little bit more polished. But, yeah, this, this is a really good puzzle escape room style game. It doesn't destroy the components, unlike the exit games. Uh, so you can pass it on to someone else, which is what I did. I think Bubba owns it now. Maybe he's giving it now to someone else. Uh, but really, really strong puzzles and an incredibly clever solution mechanism because the whole game is just is a big deck of cards. And the solution mechanism is you pull out the numbered cards that you think are associated with the number you're trying to figure out. And if they literally paint a coherent picture, then that's the solution. But it's brilliant because just on their own, all these random solution cards just look like nonsense but they only make sense when combined. It's really, really cool. Eight. Can confirm Bubba still has that. Wait, did you just confirm that with him? No, I saw it. In oh, you are at his house. Yeah. yeah. Number 81, another game right game. I think this is probably my highest game right game on the list. Sushi Go Party. It's a solid drafting game. We played it recently, and it's still really, really good. It's still solid. Don't bother with regular Sushi Go. Just get the party edition. Yeah, yeah. there's no reason. Because... Because let's be real. Anytime you have sushi, it's a party. <laughs> and this goes above. This goes above the crew and viticulture. That's so interesting to me. I do it love. It goes sushi, above though. the crew mission deep sea. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Hint, 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 that hint, an hint, ancient hint. game of strategy spoiler. is worse than a game about drafting sushi. I will say I yeah, that's have more I'm like... fun when I'm playing sushi. Go right. Like go makes me semi miserable because of how much of a brain block it is. But it, I do recognize that it's a stunningly beautiful game. Mm -hmm. So I have to reckon with that every time I do this list. Go is like when I'm doing the, the, the matchups, the pairings, Go is the worst one to show up. Because I'm like, ah, oh, I got to compare another game to Go again. And I don't know what to do. Yeah, Go is amazing. It's not necessarily the most fun, though. Yeah, it's like chess. Like, I have a lot of respect for chess, but it's it's not making my list because... I enjoy watching chess. I enjoy watching, you know, high level chess. It's like it's like watching magicians work, like do actual yeah. magic. 
I enjoy grandmasters explaining other grandmasters playing chess more than I enjoy what playing myself. Yeah, there's that YouTube channel where the guy just analyzes a different chess game every day. Have you seen that? There's a bunch of those. Yeah, it's which like one? this. Which one? Uh, he's Eastern European of some. Okay. Way. I mean, <laughs> there's a actually. lot of really great Eastern European chess players. I don't players. know if he's Russian or, or <laughs> in a, a different country that, yeah. that, just based on his accent. I don't remember his name. Anyways, he has a really good YouTube channel where he analyzes chess games, and I think he releases one a day. Okay. Number 80, Star Wars Armada. Still my favorite of the Star Wars minis-based games, although I haven't played the actual minis game. What was that one called? The, like, pure minis game? Imperial Assault? No, 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 no. uh, Legion. Legion. Oh, yeah, that was a game that existed. Does that still exist? Or did that just think so. fizzle out? Yeah, I don't think I've I've seen... Is that the one with the giant dice? Or no, that was Destiny or something? It's too many Star oh, Wars Oh, yeah, no, the Destiny had the big dice. That was the card dice game. Legion was like a Warhammer-style minis game. Oh, okay. Like, where you paint them and everything. Armada's kind of yeah. in the middle, but yeah, it does ships really well. It does big ships. I mean, it could easily Plastic be... Plastic spaceships. It could easily be a game ported over pla- to like naval combat, which is what you want with a sci-fi large ships game. I mean, that's kind of how they're always filmed in the principles and the, the language of big yep. ship battles. It's my favorite plastic spaceships on a table grid game. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks really cool. Mostly you play Amada for how cool it looks. It does look really cool. It's got some cool ships. It's just so expensive. Number 79 is Friday. I believe it's the highest solo game on my list. I would be shocked if there's one higher. Yeah, there's no way there's one higher. Uh, Yeah, it's my favorite solo game. Um, I've been playing Nemo's War a little bit. And Nemo's War could get there. I'm not sure if it will, though. Friday is just compact. It does what it does really, really well. People don't talk about this game that much anymore. I think solo gaming has kind of drifted towards these like big, big games. Yeah, now there's a demand for every game to have a solo variant, so you've got all these heroes with well, often there's, decent variants. There's but... uh, David Zerkichi. Zerkichi, uh, yeah. How do you say it? You know how to say his name? I've heard it like Turksy or something. Turksy? Like okay. But I don't know. He does like the solo modes for like every Kickstarter I see. He's really good at it too. Yeah, is it, I, I don't think I've played any of his solo modes, but yeah, he seems to has a, a lucrative business there. But yeah, Friday is just a little card game. It does deck building really, really well. It's from Freedom and Freeze. And yeah, it's my go-to solo game. I'll pull it out every once in a while. It's a good one. Good man, Friday. 78, the classic Carcassonne. Is this the third oldest game on the list? Probably. So we've already had Go and Democker. Yeah, those are the two I thought of. There's Carcassonne. Are there any others from before 2000? Oh, I think there might be. Yeah, there are two, three. There's some Reiner Knizzi games. <laughs> okay. From this follows the along with 90s. my... I was going to say, Lindsay, would you consider yeah. playing a game older than this? Yeah, this this falls along with my movie, my hot movie takes, which are that I don't watch any movie that was created before 2000. So you're just kind of proving my theory here with games, since there's really only three that made the list, that everything is better after 2000. Yeah, except... I was like, better after 2000. Except, like, the best decade for movies was, like, the 70s. And the best decade for games was probably, you know, is either the 2000s or the 2010s. My theory is just holding true. I don't know what to tell you. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't new think is always better. I don't think there's anything. So you keep saying this, Lindsay, but you keep enjoying movies where sh- we show you that are from before 2000. I've only seen Star Wars. I've only like, recently seen Star Wars. Wasn't there another? Oh, I think there I mean, was. There's a couple 99 movies, but I don't know if we've watched old movies recently. I don't know what you guys I thought there thinking. was another. Anyways. Mm-mm. Let's Whatever. jump to a new, new game, Imperial Struggle, which shockingly, I was surprised to see. I had it at number 43 on my list last time. I guess I'm a little you more skeptical. You must have been excited about, about the potential last time. I think I was. I think we had just played it. I was super excited. I've played it twice more, I think, since then. And good game. It is a very, very good game. I still seems figured struggled, out how to seems play Seems to have it. struggled from last year. I'm going to yep. ignore. I, I didn't hear the, it, but I, I heard enough of what you just said to know that it was a pun. Uh, so we're going to move on. Yeah, Imperial Struggle. Uh, this one could go way up or way down as I play it more. The last time I played with Amber, 
I just got the feeling that I'd kind of figured out how to be competent. So you got to there's a lot to really understand to really to try to figure out what you should focus on in that game. Um, which I guess could be a weakness of it, but it could also enrich in the game once you play it a few times. There's definitely a learning curve to that game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is not, should not be considered a sequel to Twilight Struggle. It is definitely much more complex and sh- ha- shares it's not some really... things, but it's it's definitely way more, it, it's very distinct. It's not a card-driven war game, so. I mean, but it, it still has it, cards. It has... It has cards and it has actions and it has kind of the tug of war thing over influence in places, but other than that, it's mostly different. Yeah, the and the sequel to Twilight Struggle would have to be called um, Twilight Struggle: New Moon. Everyone knows, so that's how you know it's not the sequel. I actually have the real sequel to Twilight Str- Struggle, which is 1989, uh, but oh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't played it yet. That was also my... the best Taylor Swift album. Sorry, <laughs> keep going. I mean, I would think the. Uh... Labyrinth would be more the sequel spiritual successor to uh, Twilight Struggle. I mean, Labyrinth was definitely inspired by... Honestly, Labyrinth might have more in common with Imperial Struggle, now that Mm, I think about it. In terms of like very specific incentive Mm. structures for different things. I don't know. Mm. They're all in the same family, but yeah. That'd That'd be an interesting case study, but... Would be interesting to look at that compare all of those games yeah let's wrap this one up with number 76 captain sonar another great real-time not quite a party game Mm -hmm. because it can get complex but yeah captain sonar is always a good time if you can have if you happen to have five or seven friends with you uh it works (laughs) i found you can actually play this at a family gathering as long as there's like two to four people who are competent or you know, happy to take on the complexity, you can give the other easier roles and include more people. Um, And we've had fun playing this at like Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it was that the engineer is is pretty simple. Really, you just need someone to be the captain who's comfortable with the stress of being (laughs) of it. Um, But everything else, you can boil it down to a pretty simple task. Even like the navigator, it's just you have one job. All you have to do is listen to what they say, draw it on the map, mm-hmm. ignore everything else. Yeah, that's true. So it's a good time, but definitely not a pandemic game. <laughs> Haven't played in a couple years for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like I've played this. So it has to have been within the last few years because I've played this with you. I definitely haven't played it since the pandemic. I know that. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, that's our first quarter of the list. Uh, number 100 through 76. As I said, this group, you could scramble these randomly and I'd look at the list and I'd be like, yeah, that probably looks about right. So all these games, I pretty much think this about the same, you know, the particular order isn't uh, as important. But yeah, all of these I like quite a bit, but not as much as the games we'll be talking about next time. So thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. You can also find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And to help out the podcast on the algorithms, go ahead and rate and review it on wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.